So one of the things that surprised me uh, was I would have expected the Indians to come to Key Biscayne, which is, was an island not connected to the mainland at the time, by canoe. And so basically to paddle up to the lighthouse and hop out and, and start the attack. Um, Thompson's second account uh, says that he first saw the Indians coming through some swamp area to the north of the lighthouse. Um, and that it was a very thick swamp of mangroves. Um, he mentioned that the, the beach was a very open area. Um, so the beach was very clear. You would have expected them to come easily through there. Uh, he also had his boat anchored just off of the lighthouse on the bay side uh, in case there was an Indian attack and he needed to escape that way. So his boat was there loaded with provisions, but um, for some reason they chose to come overland and there was one mention that it took them um, a day to go four miles or so because the, the swamps were so thick. Um, Thompson said that he thought that a um, hog was going, one of his hogs was going through the, the swampy area. Um, he knew that there were alligators there because some of his hogs had been eaten before. Um, so he looked over there, according to him, he, he smelled the coffee burning um, because uh, Carter was his cook and he was a good cook, but he always burned the coffee. Um, so at that point, they saw the Indians. Um, Thompson's second account is very unflattering uh, and frankly racist and showing the signs of the times. Um, it makes Carter sound like he was just completely um, out of sorts yeah. about the Indians running. He really made him into a caricature more than a person in that second one. Um, and Thompson saved the day by grabbing him by the hair and pulling him into the lighthouse as the Indians were attacking. Um, the Indians were described as being mostly naked except for their loincloths. Um, they had to raise their rifles above their heads to keep their gunpowder dry as they were coming through the swamp. 50 to 80, I think, was the uh, the number that Thompson identified. Thompson's first action was to run to the base of the lighthouse, which they had already had fortified. He'd filled casts with um, sand, um, boarded up the window, and he makes it sound like he did that, but I believe soldiers who came after the lighthouse was evacuated, helped fortify the base of the, the tower. Um, you could open the door, but then you had to crawl in between, underneath these casts to get to the, the stairs, which at that time were, were wooden with a central mm -hmm. wooden mast in the, the middle. Apparently as he closed the door and bolted it shut, the Indians arrived at the door. In the lighthouse tower was also stored casts of uh, whale oil for the tower. Um, I think they said 200 gallons, which would have been consistent with having, with other lighthouses of the time, they'd store them in tin casts uh, that would maybe hold 100 gallons each. And in some of the initial firing back and forth, uh, Thompson said that his, uh, he was not hit in the initial firing by the Indians, but several bullets went through his hat and through his clothing. Uh, so that's how close it was. Some of those bullets apparently also hit the tin casts of oil and the oil was ankle deep as uh, Thompson and Carter were in the base of the tower. <clears throat> um, Thompson says that he had three weapons with him a rifle and two muskets. Uh, he went to one of the upper levels of the lighthouse um, to, uh, looks like your puppy dog is there. Yeah, she's, she's giving me the sad eyes, like, why are you ignoring me? <laughs> Thompson went to one of the windows of the lighthouse. He fired his two muskets first. Um, he said it was at about 100 feet away, which is not an ideal range for a musket, uh, but some of the Indians were wounded. Uh, there was so much smoke from that that he couldn't fire again, so he went to a different window. Meanwhile, the Seminoles were shooting at the window he had been at, uh, and he was able to fire his rifle. And then he had a keg of gunpowder with him. Um, he was able to shift positions to different lighthouse windows and keep the Indians at bay. Um, after, when he first got into the tower, apparently the Indians went to his house and opened a barrel of flour and were trying to, were eating that as if they were starving, mm. uh, just shoving the raw flour into their mouths, which Thompson found uh, <laughs> amusing because they're black painted faces that had this white <laughs> flour on them. Uh, but that's when he started shooting uh, and more another round of shooting occurred. Um, he said that he 
in effect captured several, about 20 of the Indians at the base of the tower because they couldn't leave the area without him being shooting at them. Um, and he would have to very carefully poke his head out the window. At one point, he put his hat on a uh, on the end of a musket, and his hat got all shot up. <laughs> um, so some of the very it, it makes for a very uh, it's like a cartoon. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, actions that are going on. Um, eventually, the Indians brought some fire and set fire to the wooden door at the base of the lighthouse. Um, that caught the oil on fire, and in addition to the all the wood from the stuff that was barricaded there, um, Thompson had Carter stand by with an axe at the base of the tower, and his instructions were to chop off the head of Indian any Indian that got through and and climbed through. Uh, when the fire started, they tried to put it out; they were unsuccessful. They had to retreat up the tower, uh, up the wooden stairs. And lighthouses are very much like chimneys. Uh, there's a window or a door at the top of the lighthouse that's open and a door at the bottom. The heat's going to rise and it provides very good circulation, but I can imagine the smoke and flames and heat from that. I was very pleased to be involved in some of the work they've done on uh, Cape St. George Lighthouse in the Florida Panhandle, mm -hmm. uh, which is a early tower and very consistent with what was at Cape Florida at the time. Um, and at the top of the tower, uh, there was a two by two foot scuttle or hatch that was closed over with a copper, um, with a wooden hatch that was covered in copper. Uh, they closed that, took refuge at the top of the lighthouse, not a very big space. No. Uh, and the outer ledge outside of the glassed in portion of the lighthouse Tiny. is only a foot and a half or so wide. It's very narrow. Eventually, the flames got so hot that they burned through the copper hatch. And so inside the lighthouse itself, you would have had this extremely hot fire, even with the glass in the top of the tower broken from gunshots. They later said that there were evidence of 200 shots hitting the top of the lighthouse tower, either from broken glass or holes in the reflectors or, or things like that. They would have had to go outside of the glassed in portion of the lighthouse onto the narrow ledge to take refuge. And that's where Carter at or Thompson at one point said he put his feet over the edge to avoid the heat and he could feel his feet getting shot, but it was better than, than roasting. Carter was apparently up high enough to where he was shot in the chest and, and killed uh, at that point. I think Thompson used Carter's body as a shield uh, to shield away some of the heat. And then uh, there was a, another humorous episode that was in Thompson's second account, which this one I don't believe, um, Thompson said in a fit of frustration, he took his powder horn and he threw it off the top of the lighthouse tower and it happened to fall down and hit a Indian on the head and caused him to jump around and the other Indians were all laughing and he was laughing. Um, I just don't see how he could see over the edge of the top of the lighthouse. The angles just don't make sense that he would see where the right. powder horn hit and all. But in another moment of frustration, uh, Thompson decided to kill himself. He took a, his small keg of gunpowder and threw it down the scuttle into the fire. It exploded. Again, I think that explosion would have been directed primarily upwards because of the small size of the scuttle. <clears throat> Thompson wasn't killed or further injured. And in fact, it had the effect of tamping down the fire because some of the stairs fell in mm -hmm. um, and the fire was less bad. So he was able to survive up there. Um, it was at that point that Joe and Bob tried to climb up the lightning rod of the tower, uh, maybe sticking wooden sticks into the copper, uh, the braided copper of it to enable them to climb. They got uh, two thirds of the way up. According to everyone's accounts, Thompson was ready to cut the lightning rod with his knife when they gave up. And then uh, Thompson was stranded up there. The, the Indians had burned the dwelling. They were in the process of looting whatever supplies they could get. They took uh, Thompson's boat and eventually they left the area stranding Thompson at the tower, top of the tower where I think he was with Carter still at the time. Now, in his first account, he said that he said he wanted to blow up the tower and just end it all. And that didn't work. And then he decided he was going to jump off the edge. He mm -hmm. got to there and bolts was past him, but he just couldn't jump. So then he just decided he was going to lay down and let himself burn to death, basically. Mm -hmm. But in the second account, he doesn't really say that. So what do you think actually is the truth on that? Um, the second account was 10 years later. So there, there's 
different emphasis on it, and, and maybe he didn't want to say that. Um, from the contract, uh, we know the size and heights of the railing at the top of the tower. And if you wanted to jump, it would be relatively easy to climb over the railing. Mm -hmm. um, I refer to the type of construction for those early lighthouses as a bird cage design. Once you're outside of the railing, as if you're going to jump, then you are in a very exposed position to be shot. I believe that the Indians were using rifles as opposed to muskets, which would have been much more accurate uh, for hunting. Um, and that would have been a, a relatively easy shot for them to. Uh, That's what I always thought. Yeah. And, and in fact, they, you know, they shot his feet six times, according to mm -hmm. all accounts. So um, I, I don't know whether he tried to jump also and then decided not to. I know I get a little bit uh, nervous <laughs> hanging around the a narrow ledge at that height as it is. So, you know, for people who don't know, the original tower was much shorter than the present day version. Yeah, I think around 60 feet and yeah. currently it's 90. Yeah, so from only you know 60 feet away, how could they not have hit him if he was standing there? The second account um, uses some political correctness. Thompson doesn't directly say it, uh, but he does say that he was felt like he was dying of thirst and he used one of the reflectors or the newspaper account at least doesn't say this directly, but the implied thing is that he used one of the reflectors to catch his urine Mm -hmm. And then drank from that, um, and still he that didn't help parch his thirst. But um, I can imagine after being shot and burnt and everything else in the Florida sun, uh, even if you're up there for just one day, that that would be a uh, miserable and life-threatening experience as it as it was. The motto is up north. They hear the explosion for whatever reasons. They get there late. Now, when they arrived, he said that. He had all the clothes had been burned off his body for the most part, except for like a little piece of his pants. And he was able to use that blood tattered and use that as a signal flag to, to show that he was still alive. How far back do you think the waterfront was from where the tower is? Well, I think they would have come to the bay side. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe a hundred yards or so. And, and I just wanted to clarify, Thompson mentioned that his clothes would catch on fire, both his and Carter's, and so they would tear off pieces of his clothes as they, they caught on oh, fire. Okay. I don't know that he was his clothes burned on him as much, but yes, he was probably nearly naked. I would guess it's at least 100 yards or so, not terribly different than the current configuration on the south end of the island. When ships came to Cape Florida, they would come to that side. There's some shoals on the ocean side, much better anchorages, and it's a little bit more secure from the, the wind. And I think there's something that talks about them going through Bear Cut um, on the north end of Key Biscayne. Okay, so he's up there, he signals, they finally figure out he's up there. Now they go through a, a bunch of different things that you've already alluded to. Can you kind of go through the progression of things that they attempted to do to get him down? Sure. So the tower was probably still smoldering and very hot inside from the wooden stairs and the fire uh, that had occurred there. And unless you had a really tall ladder uh, to overcome it, then you're, you're still 60 feet above the ground. According to the different accounts, the, the, there were actually two ships that arrived. Uh, the schooner PD, which was also used as a wrecker, arrived at the same time as the motto. And again, this was very unusual for them to have 20 armed Marines uh, on a ship in the area. That was just a Fantastic coincidence for, for him, because otherwise they would have still been afraid of landing at all for fear of the Indians. The first thing that they tried to do was they created a kite and they flew the kite near the tower to try and get a string to uh, Thompson. And that was unsuccessful. The next thing that they tried was to tie the string to the ramrod of a musket and then fire the musket with the ramrod. And that uh, was successful. It got a small line to Thompson. I'm sure from that you tie a thicker line. Um, there was some mention of a block and tackle sort of, sort of like a pulley system. So you get that up to the top and run a thicker line through that. The Marines were used to a frigate size ship. So they would have been comfortable climbing up on ropes and lines. They were um, very accomplished sailors. And a couple of them went to the top and that's how they were able to get um, Thompson down. And I believe at that time that Carter's body was pushed off the top. 
Okay, so the the two guys they climb up the rope, they secure them, and can you describe how they got him down? I imagine that they just tied the tied the rope around his waist and then uh, lowered him down that way. Um, they use a bosun's chair or like a like kind of like a hammock, but you know, like with enveloped him in like a canvas and lowered him down by that. Um, I think it would have just been a much simpler thing of putting a rope around him and, and getting him down. Um, you know, it was. Uh, which I don't think Thompson would have, you know, it would have been absolutely painful mm -hmm. uh, and terrible, but I would have wanted to get down as quickly as possible. Oh, now, the pain that guy must have sur survived yeah. is unbelievable. At what point so, did you go uh, numb, though? Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, well, he did mention even when his feet were shot that he didn't really notice it as much because it, he was more concerned about being burnt up by the fire. Yeah. So um, when he got down to the ground, um, the sailors treated him very kindly, uh, but one of the people that was on the motto was Cooley. Again, he had mm -hmm. been as a guide to go back to the Gill Blast. Um, so it's interesting how Cooley keeps on reappearing uh, multiple times throughout the story. Okay, so after that, they took him to? Uh, originally, they went to Key West because that was the nearest uh, settlement. There was a Marine hospital there. And so he was initially given treatment there. <clears throat> and then when he wrote his account a few weeks later, he was in Charleston. Mm -hmm. um, his second account says that he is still a cripple. Um, so he, there were permanent injuries to him uh, even several years later. It said he had he was in good health, except he had to use a cane in order to walk around, which, <laughs> I mean, if that's the only trade-off you have, that's not bad at all. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if how many bullets stayed in his feet or whether... You know, he was grazed or, or just what, but um, it did obviously make him a cripple. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the interesting part of the second account, because, uh, again, that's several years later. And um, at that time, he was destitute. Uh, he was not working. He did get some money from some politicians in South Carolina. Uh, who fund, gave him enough money to go to Washington, D.C. to request a pension. Um, the basis of that pension was not only his being there at, during the attack on the White House, um, he could have claimed damages for any materials he lost. And I think somewhere he said that he had $700 in, in cash uh, <laughs> that was lost during the White House attack, but also because of his prior military service during the War of 1812. Um, <clears throat> and this is one of the interesting tie-ins that the second account gives us that he said that he was wounded in the shoulder at the Battle of Plattsburgh, uh, which was uh, on Lake Champlain. Um, and in fact, he is recorded as being a mariner, a, a master's mate of some type. So not a captain or commanding of a ship, but um, higher up in the ranks of that. He received money from the prize money from that attack. Because of those pensions from that, they listed everybody who took part in the battle. And he is listed there as John W.B. Thompson. Hmm. Um, so there's an interesting account there. There's a marriage record from um, New England of him getting married uh, to a Miss Parsons a few years before that. Uh, we don't hear anything about his family in association with the Cape Florida attack. But anyways, he would have uh, the ability to request a pension because of that military service, he was not listed as among those wounded at the Battle of Plattsburgh, um, which may not be unusual because unless you lost an arm or a leg, they might not um, record you as being wounded. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, he uh, at one point, he went to the White House to try and meet with the president a couple times and while that sounds like it might have been an embellishment, it also checks out with consistent for um, Andy Jackson's open mm -hmm. White House. Yeah, I was going to say back then you could just walk right in. Right. Well, there was a there was a doorman who he befriended, and he said, "Hey, I'm a veteran of the Florida Wars, and General Jackson mm -hmm. was in the Florida Wars." Um, so the doorman brought him in uh, to the bedchamber of the president. And while the president was having breakfast, they recounted their stories of 
uh, the Florida wars and Indians and, and things like that. And, and Jackson knew about the attack on Cape Florida because it was a, uh, a very uh, famous account. In fact, this, the, there was the Fort Mims massacre and then there was the attack on Cape Florida. And those, those attacks were frequently replete, repeated in any tales of Indian attacks up until uh, after the Civil War when you eventually had Custer and, and those Indian attacks became more, more famous. But mm -hmm. the Cooley massacre and these early ones uh, that was what folks were talking about because the Seminole Indian War was such a, a big attack. Mm 